Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mia Rook. I am the educator and interpreter here at the Landmark Inn. If you're not familiar, the Landmark Inn is in Castroville. Uh, we're located just outside of San Antonio. And today we are going to talk about historical research. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started on the PowerPoint. OK. There we go. OK, so um, this is just going to be kind of an overview of how to get started on a historical research project, um, some great resources you can use, uh, advice for um, organization techniques and things like that. OK, so um, most people uh, when doing a historic research project, um, it, you know, whether it be personal for uh, work presentations, uh, anything along those lines, they all kind of start with the same type of process. So the biggest question that people ask, um, and I've asked myself many, many times, is why do the research on your own? Um, why not just find the sources, find articles, and go from there? Um, I have boiled it down to three major points as to why you should start this research uh, from the beginning on your own. The first one is uh, credibility. This is huge. Uh, <laughs> if you are the only person doing the research and gathering the information, uh, and you're the person that takes those secondary sources, whether it be uh, books, journals, even newspaper articles in some cases, uh, and you take those and you track down where they got their information back to the primary sources, then you can guarantee that within your project, you are the only one who has tracked it and you're the one that creates the gathering of the accurate information from the very beginning. Um, and this can give you the confidence within your research to know that Everything you found is from the primary sources, and you're the one who did the work to find that information, so you know it's going to be accurate and interpreted correctly. The next one is going to be clarification. Um, this is one of those important things because a lot of times in research, you end up with um, kind of muddled information, especially if it's an older research um, topic. People have done research on things for forever. Um, and sometimes the primary information or primary sources can get kind of muddled, uh, it can be interpreted in a million different ways. And so by doing your own backtracking from the secondary sources, you can find the primary sources and interpret it um, rather than using someone else's interpretation. And the last of the three reasons is cohesion. Um, by completing research using secondary sources and primary sources and making sure that everything you have found really does tie into what you're researching, you can choose to create a cohesive research project. And it can include um, the sources that you want to include, um, not just, you know, what you've read in other sources. Um, and it can really help you kind of narrow things down in the future if you do continue. Um, for example, if you wanted to research World War One, but you wanted to focus on one battle or even one company or battalion of soldiers, you're going to have to start with that broad topic and then get those information and the sources narrowed down into that specific topic. The great thing about doing the research on your own is that you can be as broad or as narrow in your research as you'd like. So that's the that's the fun thing about historical research is that's kind of a blank canvas. So, so next we're going to talk about the process. So the research process is one of those things that can be extremely complicated or it can be 
kind of streamlined <laughs> depending on how you go about it. Um, one of the most important things in historical research and the process of doing historical research um, is that you have to really kind of decide how in depth you want to go. If you want to jump in and learn every tiny little detail, then go for it. Or if you're just doing this to either learn more or present in some form, um, then you can kind of do it uh, more broad. So the first step seems kind of funny, <laughs> but it is important. Um, most people don't decide to start a research project like this um, just on a whim with no topic in mind. Um, the only cases I can think of are school assignments where you get told you have to do something and then you have to figure it out. Most people in these kind of situations and um, process is already have in mind what they want to talk about, what they want to find out. Um, they just need to kind of kickstart where to find it and how to find it. Um, this is the step where if you, again, back to the example of World War One, if you decide I want to learn about this topic in World War One, start with World War One and narrow it down from there. And a lot of times in my own personal experience, I'll start researching something. And as I'm researching, I find something within that research that I end up focusing on instead. So that's happened a lot, <laughs> a lot more than probably should with me. So next is you're going to get some background. This is one of those steps that you don't want to skip. Um, you want to learn about a specific topic, yes, but you need to have some context. You need to understand what was going on in that time, why things were happening, whether it be a global situation like a war or even, you know, get more local. Uh, you know, here in Castroville, there were a lot of floods. Was there a flood during that time? How would it have affected the people or the thing you're researching? Um, there's a lot of chain reactions in history, and you've got to get background information on any topic you research because it may be affected by one of those things. Um, they're all kind of connected. <laughs> so um, a couple questions to ask yourself when getting background research is, was there any significant historical event that happened or was happening at the time? Uh, is there a reason that, you know, this specific topic um, was a big deal? Was there something going on in that decade or even within that century? Things like the Great Depression affected so much for so long that it was more than just a decade of things that happened because of the Great Depression. The same applies for the World Wars. You know, there was fallout for decades after. Uh, were there any major events that would influence what you're researching? So, you know, if you're researching the immigration of people to Texas, why were they immigrating? Um, what was the push factor that made them leave their homeland? What was pulling them to Texas? This is all background information that you need to know to make sure that your research project is really well-rounded and that you're confident in why you're researching that. Uh, it creates a really strong foundation. And ultimately, things like this, getting all this background information, really help you become a better researcher. And you're able to do things not necessarily quicker, but, but more in depth. So the next one is the fun step that everybody wants to jump right into. Um, and that's getting your information. Uh, we're going to discuss quite a few resources uh, on where to find information, but this is one of those steps that you can't really get to until you know the first two steps pretty well. Um, now, this can be as simple as jumping on Google, typing in something, and going from there, or it can be with your background information, something that you know, hey, this place or this site 
where this location is going to have the information that I need. So you go to those places, you go to the local libraries or the local museums and look up things. This is where it's really important to distinguish and understand that not all sources are created equal. <laughs> um, when I do historical research, I always start with secondary sources, which are, um, you know, books, articles, things like that, and then go from there. Um, starting with primary sources is a great idea, but secondary sources, especially academic sources, are going to have bibliographies and footnotes that are going to tell you exactly what they found and where they found it. And if you take that and go from there, then you can track back to those primary sources. Um, that's kind of the beauty of historical research is that it's like a scavenger hunt of information. It's important to distinguish that not all secondary sources are created equal. Um, personally, in my research, I trust academic and peer-reviewed information um, much more than I would trust a, an article from People magazine or um, even sometimes the articles in like National Geographic and stuff. Those would be good sources, yes, um, but I wouldn't primarily focus on those. Um, there's a lot of information out there that's great, and there's also a lot of misinformation. So the best thing to do in this step of gathering your information is to double and triple check. So you may find secondary sources that mention the same thing several times. Find that information, find the source that they're quoting, go to that source. Um, double and triple checking is going to be the biggest thing you do in any kind of historical research. So step four is organization. This is the most important thing in historical research because this is going to ensure that your research lasts longer than you're actually doing the research. Um, if there's not organization in your research, then anybody but you won't be able to understand it. Um, there's really no wrong way to organize your research as long as you understand how it's organized and can explain how it's organized, um, then go for it. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about different organization systems, both digital and print or physical. The only thing is, there's no wrong way to do it, but you have to be consistent in whatever way you do your historical research. Um, organization has to be the same method from the very beginning to the very end. Um, you just need to find something that works for you, something that you can easily navigate. Um, the best kind of organization is one that you don't have to explain. So if someone from off the street comes in, picks up your folder, binder, whatever, um, they should be able to go through and say, oh, this is this date, this is this date, this is this date, or this person, this location, without you having to stand there and explain it. Uh, the reason for that is because you don't want to lose information that you've worked hard to gather. And if you're not there, you know, 50, 60 years down the line, some museum educator finds your box of stuff, <laughs> you want them to be able to say, oh, this person organized this this way, found this information this way. This is great. This is a great source. Um, the last thing you want is just a box full of papers with no rhyme or reason to them. <laughs> um, and uh, as someone who's dealt with both kinds, it's better to have an organization system. So the last step in the research process is plan for your next steps. Why are you researching? What is your end goal? Uh, it could be something as simple as wanting to learn about your family history um, and sharing that with your family and, and friends. It could be something as complicated as hoping to publish one day. These are all things that you need to keep in mind before you even start. Do you want to pass this on uh, in hopes of someone 
you know, in your family continuing it? Are you presenting to an organization or a society of some kind? These are all things that you need to consider um, as your end goal. It doesn't have to be some fancy end goal. The end goal can be for you to get a better understanding um, or you to have, you know, the materials to write an in-depth history of your family or your town. Um, you just have to keep that end goal in mind because that's going to keep you motivated to continue the process and research and understand why. So next we are going to talk about my favorite step in the process, which is the organization. Um, I think that it's a fun way to keep uh, things going. And uh, it, there's so many different ways you can do it. We're only going to talk about a few, um, but I'm going to try to do as much um, as digital and physical as I, uh, I can. So organization systems, again, super important. Um, I've compiled a list of all, these are all free organization systems, um, minus supplies if you're doing physical copies. Um, now, personally, I, for all of my research, both uh, for work and academic research, I have a hybrid system that I use. I use um, a cloud system on my computers and a physical um, system where I have folders and binders. Uh, the first one is called Zotera. Zotero. Zotera. Anyways, uh, it is an online system. It is completely free. And it allows you to store and organize and also share your information. Uh, you can literally send links to people. And when you save it to your account, it puts in all of the information you need if you are going to cite it one day, which even if you're doing research for personal purposes, you should always cite it because you're going to have a situation where you go back and look at something and you're like, where did I get this? How did I find this? <laughs> and this kind of takes that uh, stress away. My favorite feature of this website is that you can actually add um, an, a plugin to your browser. And so when you're you know, researching or Googling and you find an article that you like, instead of having to download it and put it in a folder, you can just click on the add-in on your browser and it does it all for you. And it's so easy. <laughs> it has saved my butt many, many times because uh, I'm one of those people that opens like 20 tabs at a time and um, forget which ones I've saved and which ones I haven't. So it's it saves a lot of time and a lot of headaches. So, And the best part is that it's free. <laughs> so next is going to be, I think it's pronounced Quiga, but I may be wrong. Um, that's how I've been pronouncing it. And we're just going to say it's right. <laughs> so this is another online um, free system. And this one focuses mostly on PDFs, but it's kind of a step above Adobe PDF. It keeps your references together and you can annotate, highlight, read, do all of that. But the best feature for this is that once you highlight something in that PDF, um, it'll keep a list of all the highlighted phrases. And you can go back and click one of those phrases and it'll automatically search for other articles or sources that have that phrase in them. So it kind of takes the, the fun, we'll say, away from clicking Google finding the 25 pages of stuff and having to go through every page. Think, oh gosh, you know? So this one does it for you. It searches it and you can search multiple phrases. You can search just one word, a name, all that kind of stuff. So next is an old school system, <laughs> file folders, both physical and digital. Um, this is something that I've seen a lot of people do. They have folders in their desktop on whatever computer they're using. And within that folder is a million and one subfolders. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's a tried and true system, 
the only downfall to something like that is that you have saved all of your information in one location. And unless you're just using one computer all the time for all of your research, this isn't the best option because you can't access it from other locations. Um, if you're like me, I tend to research whenever and wherever I can, especially for school. So one day I might be on my laptop, one day I might be on a computer in the library. Um, I've done research on my phone. <laughs> so that's one downfall to this system uh, is that you can't have it across multiple platforms. Um, but again, if you're just using one computer, you always use, say, your home computer or your personal laptop, go for it. Save the files however you'd like. <laughs> Same applies for an actual physical file folder. Some people like it. That's more power to you. I've used um, the file folders that have the, the prongs at the top and you put the paper in. I've used those for stuff. Um, it just depends on your personal preference. So another way is Google Docs. Google Docs is kind of the cloud version of file folders. <laughs> so Google, the Google suite in general um, is a great resource. It's an all-in-one system. So you've got a drive to save things in, a Google equivalent of Word, Excel, a PDF reader, um, even PowerPoint. Google has a PowerPoint and it's all free. You just have to create a Google account. Uh, you can see here, this is my work Google account. And I've got research for one of the families that lived out here at the Landmark Inn. It's all saved in here. I can access this from any computer I can log into my Google on. I can access it on my phone if I need to, um, which I have. I've uh, been, you know, talking with another person or another educator. And I'm like, oh, let me show you this record that I found and I'll pull it up on my phone from my Google Drive. It's a great option. It's basically the same as saving multiple computers to your or multiple files to your personal computer, um, but it's in a drive that you can access anywhere you can get Google. So another great option. Now, this is the fifth option, um, the binder system, the last organization system I'm gonna mention. Um, again, there are hundreds of different ways to organize your research, do what works for you. Um, I wanted to talk about this one because it's, again, a tried and true system. There's absolutely nothing wrong with organizing your research into binders or folders. Um, as I mentioned, I have a hybrid system of organization. Um, so I have stuff that I've got in binders. I've got stuff that I've got in folders and drives, um, even on Zotero I use. Um, so I've, I've got one of my binders for work here can see and it's just a file tabbed system um i did that because the stuff in there i needed to physically have in front of me um i'm one of those people where with some stuff i just cannot stand reading it on a computer and so i print it and i put it in a binder um the most important thing to remember is that you've got to do what works best for you there's not a wrong way to organize your information. There's just, you have to be consistent and you have to do what works for you. If you wanna do hybrid, go for it. If you wanna do just physical copies, do it. It's whatever works for you and you have the space and the understanding to use. So the fun part about organization is that there's so many different options now. Um, just within the last, I would say probably five years, research organization systems have kind of skyrocketed. Uh, and there's companies like Zotero and um, Quiga, that's what we're going with. Uh, <laughs> there's hundreds more. There's paid ones that you can use. Um, there are trials that you can sign up for to see if you even like it before you pay for it. It's just a matter of what works for you. Um, the easier it is on you to organize your research, the better and the more you'll get out of it. So, so now we're going to move into free online resources. There are so many 
online resources available for research that are completely free. And I will say at least two to three times a day within just between work and academic research, I'm on most of these sites a few times a day. <laughs> so uh, the first source we're going to talk about is my favorite by far, uh, the National Archives. So this is just a screen grab of the National Archives site. Uh, when you Google National Archives, the one of the first options that pops up is um, research our records. And that's what this will take you to. This is a site where you can find thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of resources. Um, they've got digital resources. You can go through their um, archival database. You can go through their microfilm catalog. And the great thing about the National Archives is while they have a ton that has been digitized, if you find a source that you need and it's not digitized, you can submit a request. Now, it's not always a guarantee that you'll get that source because they may not have it physically able to be copied or you know you might have to pay a couple dollars to get a copy of it, but it is so easy. You just click it and fill out the form, submit it, and they get back to you usually within a couple of weeks and let you know if they can get it to you or not. So it is great. All you got to do is make a request if something you need isn't digitized. And you can look through their online catalog and it'll tell you what has been digitized and what hasn't. So, okay. Next source along the lines of the National Archives is going to be the Library of Congress. Again, another incredible site with so much information. Once you get into it, um, it's one of those you got to be careful not to go down the, the rabbit hole. Um, I've done that many, many times where I'm looking for something and see something else and get interested in that and then just veer off and spend way more time than I should researching something that has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be. It has, the Library of Congress primarily has uh, photos and um, legal documents. Uh, the library has manuscripts and letters. They do have a digital collection specifically set aside, um, but you can also look in the entire library's catalog. And again, it's one of those things, if you find something and it doesn't have a digital copy, you can submit a request. I have found that it's a little bit harder to get uh, digital copies from the Library of Congress and the National Archives, um, but it's still, it's a pretty, pretty easy process considering um, you, most of the stuff that I've had to get a request for from the Library of Congress though, I did have to pay a couple dollars. Um, so keep that in mind when you are doing this. Um, the great thing about this site, as you can see down here where it says trending, uh, they actually have major events already grouped together, uh, significant people, significant places, and you can just click, you know, Civil War, boom, and go through and see exactly what they have about the Civil War that is available. So it's an easy, easy site to navigate to. Next is a source that I feel like a lot of people kind of overlook and don't really think of because of the nature of their libraries. These are the presidential libraries. Now, this is just the JFK library. Um, it's the first one I clicked. But the presidential libraries, not only are they libraries, they're also museums. So that's another thing to consider. Um, they're a great source for both state and national records. Uh, most of the presidential libraries have information, artifacts, documents, um, really great sources for not just that president's time as a president, but usually their entire life. So um, you can find quite a bit of information on a lot of different topics just from the presidential libraries. And again, they're libraries. So if they've got something that you'd like to know more about, send an email, send a research request. Um, they, librarians are, I feel like an underutilized source and they are super smart people who their entire job is to help people learn. And so if they've got something you wanna know more about, send an email. The worst they can do is say, we can't help you, you know? 
So next we're going to talk about a website called the Family Search. Now, Family Search is a genealogical website. It's very similar to Ancestry, but it is free. I know that a lot of times people doing historical research uh, are either doing genealogical research or historical research, but they intertwine a lot more than people think. Um, genealogical research, of course, is going to be specific families, your family, a family you know about, so on and so forth. Non-genealogical research still uses a ton of genealogical source material, things like military records, census records, even background information. You know, if you're researching, we'll use the Landmark Inn as an example. If you're researching the Landmark Inn and you find out that there were several families that were either here or owned the property, you're going to need to know more than just their names. <laughs> you're going to want to know why they ended up here, where they ended up after they left here, if they stayed here, and that kind of stuff. And that's all stuff that you can find on genealogical websites. Family search isn't as in-depth as Ancestry because it is free, but there's a lot of good information, a lot of good places to start that research on specific people, specific time periods, things like that. So next is university libraries. Again, another one I don't think people think of a lot unless you're in the academic world. Now, a lot of universities have digital libraries that you can search. Some of them you do have to sign in as a student, but not all the time. And the great thing about this is that even if you're not signed in as a student, you can still access their catalog. You just can't get into the actual PDF or the actual video, that kind of thing. So this is a great way to start your search for primary and secondary sources. A lot of universities are going to have a ton of articles that are peer reviewed, um, even archival articles. So you find the name of an article, like we'll look at this one, the Durable Stones article. I want to read that. It's about the archaeology of Castroville. Okay. I can't get access to that on this site unless I'm a student. So that leads us into the next option, which is Google Scholar. If you can see here, the second one that pulled up on Google Scholar when I typed in Castroville is that article from the UTSA library that I wasn't able to get access to. Now it's on there and there are seven different versions that I can find. Super easy. Google Scholar is something that a lot of people don't know about. It's primarily an academic thing, but it is so valuable because it's just like Google. You search what you want to search, but it only brings up things that have been either published academically, professionally, or peer-reviewed, which are, in my opinion, much easier to weed out secondary sources that are not going to be useful in your research. Um, I use Google Scholar all the time as a grad student. Um, and when I was a librarian at a high school, I taught kids use Google Scholar. It's so much better than Google when you're looking for credible sources. Um, and it's free, part of Google, easy to find. And a lot of them, when you pull them up, will have the PDF where you can just click it and it automatically downloads PDF. No need to log in to any libraries or anything like that. So it's a great source. So now we're going to talk about in-person resources. Three of those I feel like are super important, super helpful, and something that I feel like get under underutilized for sure. Um, the first one, of course, naturally, is uh, local museums. So based on where you live, what you live around, resources are going to be different in person um, because, you know, some places, some towns don't have museums. Some towns don't have a local library. Um, so, you know, obviously 
it's going to depend on where you live. But if you're researching a specific place, say, for example, you want to learn about the old homes in Boston and you plan on visiting Boston to do this research, the first thing you should look for are local museums, local libraries, and historical societies. And I will push this so hard. These are such underutilized sources. You've got to understand that all of these places are filled with people whose entire goal is to help you learn about the place they are. So a lot of places uh, like local museums have people like myself who are educators, researchers, um, and their entire goal is to help you learn history. Personally, and I can only speak for myself, I love it when we have local, even people from out of state come in and ask me research questions and ask for help kind of figuring out how to get started on that kind of research. It gives me an opportunity to educate on how to research the community that I work in and care about, and it gives me an opportunity to learn something that I might not have known, um, you know, doing research for a family that I didn't think to research, things like that. So the same applies for your local libraries. Librarians are the unsung heroes of the historical world. <laughs> they are little walking Google machines. Um, our local library here is great in Castroville. They are all so helpful and so sweet. And if you want to go in and look, because most libraries have an archives or even a collections of some kind, you can make an appointment, go in and request to look at them. Uh, depending on the library, depends on what kind of specifications they have um, and rules. But reach out, ask questions, say, hey, can I set up an appointment? Go in and see if you can talk to a librarian. Um, they're great. And that's not just because I used to be a librarian that I love librarians. They're just great in general. <laughs> so the next is such an untapped resource, local historical societies, conservation societies, genealogical societies. These are groups of people who are all historians in their own right. They are a part of a society that is specifically created to teach the history, learn the history, and research the history of their communities. They are full of passionate people who oftentimes have spent years, if not decades, <laughs> learning the history that you wanna know about. Um, they're a great resource and a great group just to have communication with and kind of an established um, you know, work friendship with them. So, um, they are super fun, and every historical society I've worked with has just been phenomenal. So, so wrapping up, remember that the biggest key to historical research is your curiosity. Uh, without curiosity, you're going to burn out. Simple as it is. Um, that curiosity is going to fuel your research, and there is such a fun feeling that you get when you're doing some kind of research and you've been, you know, digging through primary sources, you've been digging through stuff and you find that one piece of information that just is the key to everything. And it's that click in your brain. It's such a great feeling. It's a very like aha moment. <laughs> so, and the biggest key to successful historical research is doing what works for you. Um, 100%. If you aren't passionate and comfortable with what you're doing, you're not going to want to keep doing it. And so you've got to do what works for you, what makes you happy, and what drives that curiosity. So so I'm going to pop my email up on the screen. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, anything like that, please feel free to email me. You can call our site. Um, I'll open it up once I stop screen sharing for any questions that people have right now, um, but I would be happy to help with anything um, research related, any questions anyone has, things like that. So let me go to the Q&A and see if I can't answer a couple questions. Okay, how do I, there we go. Okay, 
I will um, be happy to share any uh, copies of the PowerPoint anyone would like. This presentation will also be recorded and put on um, the THC webinar site. So I'd be happy to share that. Um, my favorite networking system that I've used with other researchers is Teams, um, but it is a Microsoft system. So that would be um, something that is a, is a paid, I believe. Um, I've used Teams both academically and um, in work as well. Uh, so networking, probably Teams is easier. Zoom is also a great option. You can do Zoom meetings and things like that. Oh, thank you, Lisa. I'm so glad you're good. <laughs> um, there are some great options for newspaper articles. There is a website called newspapers.com. It is a paid subscription, but if you get Ancestry, you get newspapers and a site called Fold3, um, which is all access to newspapers and military records. Uh, Google Scholar is free, William. Uh, it's completely free. You don't have to have any specific login or anything like that. Uh, the National Archives do charge if they have to scan something for you. Um, I think the most I've spent is like 10 bucks on a record, um, and it was like a whole section of a microfilm record. So, um, Stephen, if you want to send me an email, we can, uh, I would be happy to help you with that um, and get started on finding uh, residential information. I it depends on what you're researching, Karen. <laughs> so um, personally, I try to do um, 10 to 15 to start. And then um, if I'm not finding the primary sources that I want from those secondary articles, then I bump that number up to up to 20 to 30. So mm -hmm. county clerk's offices are great. Smithsonian is awesome. Um, I love the Smithsonian. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Fold3 is awesome. I like Fold3 a lot. Fold3 is for um, military records. In fact, I went through Fold3 to find some personal family military records um, and things like that. I have had some issues with newspapers.com. There is also the University of North Texas has a digitized, uh, it's called the, I think it's called the Texas Portal. Um, it's all Texas newspaper articles, but they go way far back. Um, I actually helped work on those a little bit when I was a student at UNT. Um, and it's a great project. They're continuously uploading stuff. Uh, so check out, it's the UNT uh, History Texas Portal, Texas History Portal, I think is what it's called. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> okay. So microfilm digitization is one of those things that you either have to send out to do or purchase the machine yourself. Um, they are so fun to go through microreels. If you've ever done microreels, it's a headache inducing process. Um, I would recommend, there's a lot of companies I know that you can actually send your microfilm to and they can digitize it for you. It's a little costly, but it's cheaper than having to buy a digitization machine or a microfilm machine um, on your own for your company. Chronicling America is a great site. Um, there's also one called uh, US News Timeline, I wanna say. Um, let me see. I think it's called US News Timeline and it actually shows you a map and you can type in dates and a specific thing and then it bounces and it tells you exactly where and how many times it was mentioned. Have a little nice little scoop if you're doing a narrative. Yes, yes. Uh, and the thing with um, longer publications is that it's a lot harder to get published than people think, uh, especially if you're going for something big like Southwestern Historical Quarterly and things like that. Um, I've had quite quite a time. Yes, Portal to Texas History. Thank you, Georgia. Photo restoration is one of those that you can learn how to do. Um, I'm actually in the process of learning, trying to learn, I say trying very lightly, um, to colorize photos. Um, but there are a ton of online videos and stuff on how to do that yourself. But if you don't want to do it yourself, Rosemary, you can also look into sending them. Um, it's a huge business. 
uh, photo restoration is a big business. Uh, so there are tons of sources. I know even on Etsy, um, there's people that can do it, it for relatively well priced. So thank you guys. Um, I can see about getting a transcript. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Geological work. Ooh. Um, okay. Sean Broadhead. Geological work. I would recommend looking into archaeological societies in your area because usually archaeologists and geologists work hand in hand. Um, there's also quite a few online organizations that deal with geological work in different areas. Um, yes, Beth, let me see if I can pull that up real quick without jumping out of Zoom. It is called usnewsmap.com. I'll type that in. It is usnewsmap.com. Okay, I'm going to type it into the chat. Um, and that it's really cool. It's it's you put in two dates, you put in a, a keyword and it gives you a map and it, you know, the darker or the brighter the color, the more it's mentioned. Um, it's quite a lot of fun. Yeah, an external hard drive is a good option, Elizabeth. Um, my dad actually, when he was doing his PhD, kept everything on a flash drive, <laughs> which I'm the kind of person where I triple backup stuff. So, you know, I've got it in three different places. Um, but he, I mean, it worked for him and he did great. And he obviously, he got his PhD. So, <laughs> you know, it works. Um, it's just whatever is best for you. So, I personally, uh, Raymond, I personally use Turabian um, citation, which is a footnote format, but that's just because. Um, that's what I've been using since my undergrad programs. Um, I did use the American Anthropological Citation for a little while um, for that degree, but since then um, I've just been using Turabian, but Chicago is much more um, user-friendly if you're gonna not do it for academic purposes. So architecture, Stephen, is one of those that's, it's better to find a person that knows the architecture. Um, there are quite a few architectural societies I know in the US, um, but they're in bigger cities, Boston, New York, Chicago, that kind of stuff. Oh, well, that's great um, that you do exhibits for your county museum. That's wonderful. I love doing exhibits. There we go, Tanya. I did not know that you could get mineral contracts from Texas File. There you go. You and uh, Steven should connect. <laughs> yes, you can uh, hire genealogists. You can also hire them through um, Ancestry and uh, Family Tree, the, the free one that I mentioned. You can hire a genealogist, Joyce. Uh, maps. Maps are one of those that sometimes there's an abundance and sometimes there are zero for what you're looking for. Um, I would recommend to start in the map world if you're going through Texas, uh, looking at UT's library, they have a collection called the Sanborn maps. Um, and they're actually fire insurance maps, but I have used those a ton and a lot of research that I've done. And um, they hit most major cities um, in starting 1870s. So uh, UT's going to be the the place to look if you're looking for Texas maps. Yep, one dollar a page. It's not terrible. Um, and I mean, when you think about that, you also have to consider that, um, you know, someone's actually doing the, the thing for you. So one bucket, one bucket page isn't too bad. Yes. So um, great, great point, Mac. Uh, a lot of public libraries, you can access things. I know that if you go to one of the National Archive buildings, one of the physical locations, uh, there's one in Austin. I know there's one in Fort Worth that I've been to. You can actually access stuff like Ancestry for free through their computers. Um, so that's another thing you have to consider um, that you can absolutely go to a library and access their stuff. Perfect. 
Thank you, Teddy. Professional genealogist is a great one. Turabian, yes. That's I live and breathe Turabian formatting now. <laughs> Uh, Patricia, you should be able to just click on Q&A next to participants and it should pull it up. History Hub. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we've got about five more minutes. If anyone has any questions, I'm going to put my email in the chat um, for anybody that wants to shoot me an email. Um, I will happily answer that. I'll have to check out uh, History Hub, William. I've heard of it. I've um only seen it a couple times so I haven't actually had time to go in and explore but I, I know that it's a great research support system so well thank you everyone for coming this has been great uh, as you can tell I I love historical research it's something that I do every single day even when I'm not working because I'm in grad school um and it's a it's a fun fun thing to do and it's just, I don't know, it's a good thing to do because you can pass it on for later. <laughs> so, okay, well, if anyone has any other questions, I think I answered everything. If not, type and let me know. I'd be happy to. Yeah, and, um, to go back to the National Archives, there's actually programs within the National Archives and the Library of Congress where you can sign up to do transcriptions and digitization as just a uh, amateur archivist. Um, and it's one of those, they send you stuff, you, you know, fill out paperwork and everything, of course, because it is a national thing. And then uh, you transcribe something and, uh, they go through and approve it and you could end up having your transcription on their website. So uh, definitely something to look into. So, okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Yes, yeah. William, I, I'd go down the rabbit hole way too much. <laughs> yeah, I've found myself 10, 20 minutes later looking at something completely unrelated. So, oh, thank you, Tanya. I enjoyed it. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and end it. Um, if, like I said, if you want to view this again, it should be on the THC website pretty soon. Um, I will also have a copy of the recording um, that I'd be happy to send if anyone wants to send me an email for that. So, no other questions? Okay, well, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, and I hope you join us for uh, our other webinars coming up. We've got some more coming up this year, um, and I'm excited to do that. So uh, I'm going to sign off. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. Thank you.